I was doing the dishes the other day, just listening to First Corinthians, and I was, you know, got to First Corinthians six, where Paul says, "Do not be deceived." You know, the, uh, uh, men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I was just listening to that, and I've read First Corinthians many, many times, but it's just like I'm surprised that this book is still even legal in California. <laughs> Welcome to the Fall Estate. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Don't forget that the Fall Estate is on Patreon. So click the Patreon description to support our work, all right? I have with me Beckett Cook, the host of the Beckett Cook Show on YouTube. Also the author of A Change of Affection, a gay man's incredible story of redemption. Thanks for coming, man. Thank you for having me. I totally appreciate it. I love being here. What made you decide to come out and just tell the world your personal stuff, you know, about being gay and all that, especially in the Christian world. What made you decide to do that? Well, I got saved 12 years ago. So before 12 years ago, I was living as a gay man in Hollywood for many, many years, since I, was, I moved here in 1993. But the reason I wrote the book is a change of affection in 20, it came out in 2019, but I wrote it while I was in seminary at Biola University. And I wrote it because I felt like the church is uh, confused now about this issue, about yeah. homosexuality, yeah. homosexual behavior. And, and so I really wrote the book to edify the church, to help Christians understand this issue biblically, theologically, culturally, and from someone who's been on both sides of it. And so that's, that's really why I wrote the book, to kind of strengthen the church, because it's, the church is so confused. It right really now is, especially today. Um, when you were uh, uh, gay, did you identify as being gay? Yes. And what made you identify with that? I just, I, when, when I was in high school and college, I didn't, identify as gay. I just thought it was kind of, this was a desire I had right. for same sex. I never identified it. It wasn't until I met my, right after college, I met my first boyfriend. And that was when I really started identifying as gay. I came out to my, my family, my, all my friends. And then of course, when I moved to LA right after that, the whole you know, culture around me, all my friends in LA, Encur you know, it was like encouraged to right. to use that as your identity, and so oh, it became my full blown identity for twenty years. And at some point, did you know something was wrong with it, or did you accept it as being right, or did you accept it but you knew something was wrong? It wasn't normal. I. It's kind of like Romans one. Paul Paul talks about suppressing the truth. And he uses homosexual behavior as the example of suppressing the truth in that whole chapter. And I, when I was living as a gay man, I, I embraced it and I embraced gay culture. I had many boyfriends and lots of gay friends. But I think deep down inside, I knew, I knew that there was something not quite right. Yeah. But I, I just kind of ignored that. I ignored those, yeah. those thoughts and, and just kind of fully embraced the life. I've, I've, over the last 31 years since starting a barn, I've talked with men and women around the world, all races, and uh, most of them have said they were in that fallen state and they knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. At some point they tried to accept it as a right in order to live with it, I guess but they've always known that something was wrong. They just didn't know how to overcome it. And so they would accept it as them, identify with it, to try to live with themselves and with others. Right, and I mean, also God was not even in the picture for me. I, I was an, basically an atheist, so without, a, a, without any sort of basis for morality, there was no reason for me not to pursue that life, right. not to pursue those desires, because why not? And yeah. 
it wasn't until 12 years ago when I met Jesus uh, that everything changed. Right on. And, um, and when you say everything changed, what changed exactly? Um, my entire world changed. So I, 12 years ago, I, I met some people at a coffee shop who were Christians. They invited me to their church in Hollywood called Reality LA, uh, which is an evangelical church. And I went to the, the service. I, I reluctantly went to the service. I, it was weird <laughs> yeah. that I even went. The fact that I went is crazy. Um, Cause, but I was kind of at a point in my life where I was like, is that all there is? You know, I was right. having that kind of moment in my life. So I went and I heard the sermon and completely was just like overwhelmed by the, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I, I just started bawling and bawling. And, and, and that's when I, I literally, that's when God revealed himself to me. And I'll never forget, it was like he said, in my mind, he said, I'm God, Jesus is my son, heaven is real, hell is real, the Bible is true, welcome yeah. to my kingdom. And I knew immediately in that moment that homosexual behavior was wrong. I knew it was a sin. I knew it was no longer my identity. I knew that dating guys was no longer a part of my future, but I didn't care because I just met Jesus. And I was like, I'm going to go with him. Forget those guys. Right. Because that, that's yeah. just like rubbish, as Paul says. And, uh, and so my, obviously my sexuality changed or so I, 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 I'm a single celibate man, and I will be for the rest of my life. And, when, and I don't care. Like, it's not, right. I, I'm thrilled. Like, I'm, the fact that I have a relationship with God through Christ is amazing to me, and that's all I need. Like, his grace is sufficient. And the other things that changed was one, as soon as God, I mean, I was kind of a road to Damascus moment when I had that moment in church. It was so powerful that God just made everything so clear for me immediately. And I knew the image of God. I knew that humans were created in the image of God. I knew that there was a fall. And so that completely, I immediately understood, oh, the fall. That's why humanity is so messed up. Yeah. Number two, the image of God, I became pro-life immediately. I was pro-choice before really? I got saved. I immediately became pro-life. I understood that. You know, God, all life is sacred. Uh, and so I became pro-life. And, I mean, to be honest, I, my, I became, because I lived, I was, a, I was a liberal. I used to go to Ariana Huffington's house for cocktails. I was friends with all the liberals, elites in L.A. Amazing. What and, type of work did you do? Production design. I was a production designer. Oh, so that's why you knew all those people. Yeah, and I have a tons of all my close friends were in Holly in the business. Right. They worked and they were producers, directors, actors, uh, very successful people who run this town now and who provide all the content that's blinding everyone. Um, but I was, you know, I was super liberal and progressive in my politics, and uh, all my friends were, of course. But again, after that day, I understood, once I understood the truth, when God revealed the truth and I could see the, that, you know, the meaning of life, I, everything kind of, I became conservative. Because you, it's got, yeah. you kind of have to, yeah. you know, because your values change. Your values you. change. Yeah. Like everything changed. So um, I, I understood righteous righteousness versus wickedness you know for the first time because again before i was saved i lived in a postmodern world where there was no right or wrong there's no up or down right it's just all kind of vague and everything subjective and based on your feelings but when i after i got saved i i understood immediately that there is objective truth and that you can know the objective truth and God, Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And so that changed everything, including that changed my sexuality, my politics, my, my everything. 
And was the spirit of homosexuality taken away from you? The thing that made a home of you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, uh, so I, there still is, there are still vestiges of sometimes a vague sense of same-sex attraction, right. but very, uh, very rare. Like, God had so much grace on me that I say this, you know, be, the day before I got saved, my libido was 100%, right? <laughs> the day after, it was like 10%. Oh, okay. And it's remained like that or lower. And so before I was a Christian, my, li my, my thought life was dominated by sexuality. And now it's not at all. Amazing. <laughs> I, I rarely think about it. Amazing. Um, did you, uh, so while growing up, were your parents Christian? Yes, they, yes, they were Cat Roman Catholics. Catholic. But they and, were born again Catholics. Oh, okay. Which is a whole different animal. What's the difference between a Roman Catholic and a born again Catholic? Because I'm learning more about the Catholic religion over the years, but I don't know a lot about it. Uh, born, my parents were basically born again Christians, but attended Catholic Mass. That was oh. um, so. Catholic, I think Roman Catholics believe that you're born again when you're baptized as an infant. That's the new birth. Oh, really? Which is erroneous, and um, and so. That's kind of, but but they, my parents were born again later in life because they used to go to like a Catholic charismatic movement thing in the 70s. Right. You know, do you remember that? There was a movement. They, so they would go to mass on Sunday and then go to this charismatic thing <laughs> after. Yeah. And so that's where they really uh, met Jesus. Like, that's where they really were born again, yeah. my parents. And I have seven siblings and they're all Christians too. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Are you the oldest? I'm young? the youngest. The youngest. All 10 of us are Christians. My parents are in heaven right now. Oh. Yeah. Um, so while, while growing up, did they, did they influence you with their religion at all? Or you just ignored it? They did. I mean, I, you know, I went to Catholic school. I went to oh, Jesuit so you were schools Catholic. my whole life. Oh, okay. You know, and, um, but it's funny because, we, you know, we never, in my high school, my Jesuit high school, all boys school with the Jesuit priest, we never... Um, Opened the Bible. You never opened the Bible? We had religion class every day <laughs> for an hour. We never once read the Bible. Really? Isn't that weird? And so you guys went studying about God? Yeah. Uh, we just we just like read, you know, Thomas Aquinas or something. Oh, you see. know, we never really the gospel was kind of never really presented clearly. Right. But anyway, I I my fam I my family were, were all believers. I knew they were believers. And I knew, it's interesting because whenever I would go home to Dallas, I'm from, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, whenever I would go home for the holidays and I was around my siblings or my parents, they, all they would do was talk about Jesus. And, <laughs> and it's weird because I, I knew that their faith was real. I could tell it was real. Right. But I thought, for me, the, I can never be a Christian because I'm gay. So... I can never believe in God. And so I in, ended up convincing myself that God didn't exist. Amazing. It, it was this weird kind of thing, tension in my life. How did your siblings feel about you being gay? You're the youngest, you're not the Christian, you're the gay one. They were upset. They yeah. were very upset. Oh, my, okay. my siblings uh, and my parents were, they were distraught about it when I came out to them and but they didn't really, they weren't a big part of my life as an adult because I moved to L.A. right, right. after school. So they, they didn't really have any kind of say in my life. Why did you tell them then? Why did you have to tell them you were gay? Um, because I, uh, because I, you know, because I was dating guys and it was kind of, uh, it just became clear in my family. Because my, my parents, actually the way it, it all happened is I moved to Tokyo after college for a year. And while I was in Tokyo, my sister wrote me a letter. And she said, hey, she started suspecting I was gay. And I wrote her this long letter back saying, yes, I'm gay, like blah, blah. And I explained it all to her. And she actually is the one who told my whole family. Oh. So I didn't really actually come out. To the, she, did all the, she, did all, she did all the work for me. Yeah. So by the time I, I moved back from Tokyo to Dallas, everyone knew. 
but they were not, my siblings were not happy about it. I mean, they, they wanted to, it's funny because I was gonna, I was moving to Austin to live with my boyfriend at the time and they were gonna like stage kind of an intervention <laughs> and like try to stop me. I'm like, you can't stop me. Um, I'm like 23 years old. So, yeah. Um, your father accepted it once you told him to? He was okay with it or? No, I mean, he, my father was like a man's man. Yeah. He, he was like, you know, but, so it was, with him, he said, First of all, I was the youngest of eight, so I think by the time they got to me, my dad was just kind of like, he was, like what else? he was tired. Yeah. Like, but also, he came up to me right when I got home from Tokyo. He came up to me and he said, "Hey, Beck, um, I heard you know I heard you're homosexual, and you know I just want to know did I do anything wrong? Like as a father, did I, you know?" And he asked like several questions about that, and I said, "No, Dad, it's not." I just kind of tried to allay his fears or his concerns. And I said, no, dad, like, this is not your fault. This is just who I am. And I think I even said I was, you know, I was born this way, you know, <laughs> like, and so he definitely was disappointed or, you know, disturbed by it. Yeah. But there, again, there was really nothing he could do about it. Yeah. And plus I just, and then I was, I was enrolled in law school and in dental school in Dallas at SMU Law School and Baylor Dental School. And, um, and two weeks before classes started, I decided to skip grad school and I moved to LA instead. Oh. So my dad, it was just kind of like, he's like, what? my son's gay, he's not <laughs> going to law school, because my dad was a lawyer. He's not going to law school and he's moving to LA. You know, it's, it was just a lot. But, it's, like it's over. Yeah, it's over. Um. Uh, why is it that mothers tend to accept wrongdoing as opposed to fathers in most cases? The mother, you go to your mother, she's like, oh, okay, I love you. But the father, like, no, what's up, right? Why is it that women tend to accept stuff more easier than, or not more easier, easier than men, yeah, than fathers? Yeah, that's an interesting, I think mothers, my mother was very loving. She didn't accept that I was, you know, gay. Um, she didn't like that, but she was very, very loving. And my, actually, my, my dad was very, very loving to me over the years. He was always very loving. But I think, in general, women, mothers are much more, um, they're much more, especially with their sons, they're much more attached to them, and I think, and this, I see this happen in, in the Christian church a lot, where if a Christian mother's son comes out, it's very difficult for her to, to still have her convictions that homosexual behavior is a sin. They, a lot of times the mothers end up <laughs> de becoming gay affirming. I, I've seen this happen over and over again. Gay affirming, what do you mean? That they, if, they think that you can be gay and a Christian. Oh, I see. Um, so... I, I just think, yeah, mothers are just more sensitive, you know, than fathers are about it, and they, they are more emotional about it, yeah. so I think that's why. And do you think that's why they accept stuff easier than men, because they're emotional about it? Yeah, because my father was very cut and dry. Right. Like, it's, it's like, you're either this or that, and it's like, you know, he's, he's, so, but again, I don't, I don't know what my father was thinking kind of behind the scenes right. after I, after he found out because we really never discussed it. Oh, I see. So um, all I knew that is was you know whenever I talked to him on the phone in L.A., he was just so love. He was just every time he would say I love you back, you know, blah blah blah. So he was always loving to me. How did you become gay? That's a great question. Um, so there's. It's different theories on why, obviously, you know, there's there's the genetic, there's environmental, there's hormonal in utero. And um, I don't know what parts of those affected me, but at a very young age, my brother, who's a year older than I am, he and I, uh, well, he had a friend who lived, a neighbor, and he invited, he, he I think we were like 
in third grade or younger. He invited us over and showed us his father's Playboy magazines. Mm -hmm. So my first, it was my first introduction into pornography, into sexuality. So it was very shocking to yeah, me. The, these images were really, really shocking. And it's, but see, it didn't happen to my brother, so I don't know if this is the cause, but what, for me, it kind of unlocked this lust in me and but there was nowhere for me to put the lust. <laughs> but since I was around guys all the time in my yeah. class, that's where the lust was directed. Oh, I see. And then when I was nine years old, I was I I woke up. I was spent the night at a friend's house from my school, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and his father was molesting me. Wow! Oh, so amazing. that that was a huge. I think that was like the turn, a major turning point for me. Because I think before that, I think I could have gone either direction, but right. that experience, I think, really, you know, shifted me into, into we, homosexuality. Um, and so when you think of that now, what do you think about, how do you feel about that? About that night? Uh -huh. um, I think it, well, the thing is, before I was a Christian, I thought, you know, that night was no, not a big deal. I was kind of like, oh, it was no big deal. After I became a Christian, I, I now look back on that night as very traumatic. And because it was, um, it was the first thought in my mind when I woke up to him molesting me was, if, I, if he knows I'm awake, he's going to kill me. I thought he was going to, I, I had this image in my mind of him stabbing me yeah. with a knife. And so that, now I understand that that night ha was very uh, destructive. Are you over that now? I, I don't know. I mean, I th I've, I've been prayed. I, I've gone to my pastors many times and prayed about it. And, and I think I am. But I mean, um, I don't know. I, I, I think I am. Who were you closest to growing up, your father or your mother? My mother. Your mother. We were like best friends. Really? Yeah. Growing up, you're your mother's best friend. I was her, I was like her surrogate husband. Wow. Bird, well, how did that feel? What was that like for you? See, well, because my father was, um, he was busy working all the time. And, you know, he, and so my mother turned to me a lot for kind of comfort. Yeah. And it was like, it was it literally. It felt like I was her kind of second, her con, second secondary concubine or whatever it's called, <laughs> and um, so it, it, it had this weird feeling of. It was a codependent relationship, but yeah. but it was, I I enjoyed it because I liked being needed by my mother, so it was kind of this really messy relationship. Did you, how did you feel about it when you first realized what she was doing? Did you like it then, or you just came to like it? Um, I didn't really kind of, it took me a long time until I was an adult to understand what, how, what the relationship was, but yeah. that it was super codependent. But, um, yeah, but I, I, liked, I liked the fact that she loved me so much and that she relied on me so much and needed me so much. I liked being needed. I mean, who doesn't want to be needed by their mother? You know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> and so I, I liked our relationship, you know, growing that, up. Did you, did you sleep with her while growing up? No. You never slept in the same bed with her? No. And did it feel like a trauma when she was doing that? You didn't want her to make her that, to be that close to her in the beginning? No, no. It just felt like my mother was a very sensitive yeah. human being. I know what you mean. Very, very sensitive. And I was very sensitive as a little boy, and so we connected on that. So you became like her? Yeah. And are you surprised you became like your mother? Not now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not surprised by that. And so did you forgive her for doing that to you? No, I haven't. Why not? I just I haven't thought of doing it. Now that you're thinking of it, do you think you need to forgive her for that? Probably. Because what happens is mothers, when they do that to their children, they impose their will upon their children. 
And when you're a kid, you resent it at first. And then when you resent it, you become like what you resent. You take on her identity, the same spirits of her, and now in you. So it feel like it's okay after a while, right? Yeah. But she really created your her image. And that can have a lot to do with you feeling that you were gay. Yeah. Because you had the woman's spirit rather than the father's spirit. Yeah, so I, I guess I do need to forgive her. <laughs> yeah. And then that way God will forgive you and you'll be free forever. Because yeah. you were never a homosexual. You just took on the woman's identity. And it felt that way. Yeah. The I mindset and emotion and stuff that come with it. Yeah. I think, that's, I think that had a lot to do with it. Amazing, huh? Yeah. Because we are a spirit and everything we do is spiritual. And I know so many mothers around the world who have imposed their will upon their children and created them in their image. They have turned them away from the father. Mm -hmm. And when you turn the children away from the earthly father, you turn them away from God and you take on the woman's identity, right? And so if you don't love your earthly father, you cannot love God because men represent God. We are sons of God. Even in a fallen state, we've just been turned away from yeah. him. Yeah. And my, my father, I had my relationship with my dad was very minimal. Yeah. We barely spoke to each other. Yeah. Your mother didn't want you to. She made sure you didn't. <laughs> Maybe. You might be right. I like the insight. You like it? Yeah. You can see where I'm, talk where I'm yeah. coming from? Really? Yeah. Nice. And so now that you see it, will you go and forgive her for what she's done so God can forgive you? Yes. Oh, good. I will. And she might not like it. She might try to deny it and all that. But just, you know how God said... Well, she's in heaven, so I can't talk oh, to her right good. now. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah. in heaven, I'll talk to her about it. But, <laughs> but well, I, I will forgive her. Yeah. I do forgive her. Because she couldn't help her. Her mother did it to her, too. And it goes on from generation to generation. Yeah. She became like her mother. Yeah. Um, and so... Just you realize you know, I'm not you're not a homosexual anymore. Were you a radical homosexual at any point? No, I was never super. I wasn't like an activist. Oh, good. Okay. No, no, no. What, I mean, I did go to gay pride parades in New York, L.A., San Francisco. I yeah. went to all. You know, I used I would go to gay bars all the time with my friends. Right. And but I was never like a militant gay guy. Nice. Um, what was your impression of the radical ones, the militant ones, the activist ones, and? impose himself on the rest of the world. I just thought it was in bad taste. <laughs> you know, when I, would, when I would go to these gay pride parades and there would be kind of like ha naked men yeah. basically on floats dancing. And like, I just, my friend, all my friends, we would just be like, oh, this is ridiculous. Like, what are they doing? Yeah. So I, I never kind of bought into that whole extreme part of it. What caused them to go that deep into where they are on, on the float naked and in front of children and everything? What causes that? Um, the fallen state. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I, I think it's just a, it's this re very kind of rebellious heart. Um, it's a, I think what, it, what causes it is, as kids, a lot of those guys were, you know, bullied or made fun of yeah. for being gay or whatever. Yeah. And like, this is now, this is the rage that's coming out, you know, of them. Like, literally, there's a gay bar in West Hollywood called The Rage. Oh, Do yeah. you know that? <laughs> no. Do you know that? It's been there since the 80s. Yeah. But there's this rage uh, because, because of, you know, what they experienced in their childhood. And I know a lot of guys who, who even now, I know friends of mine create TV shows that are gay themed. They're old friends of mine. They create TV shows that on Netflix that are all gay characters or yeah. a lot of gay characters. Yeah. And those, those guys were bullied as when they were in high, well, high school oh, okay. as, uh, as gay guys. They were bullied. And so now this is kind of like almost like their revenge you know, yeah. on, on the culture. And so, uh, and they're, and right now in culture, as we all know, they're getting the last laugh right? because the, uh, the culture's all in. It's all know. in now. It's all in. Yeah. What is the way for the, to overcome that, uh, the Christian world and the straight world, how can they overcome what has happened to them now? The homosexuals are all in they, they have influence over everything, the media and everything. The gospel. How can Christians overcome that? 
How can Christians overcome it? I mean, yeah, overcome that influence that these people are having on their children, yeah. on society at large. Um, here's the thing. The, the, what Christians, I think a lot of the church, a lot of Christians are unaware of the cultural indoctrination that's been going on for 60 years yeah. since the sexual revolution. There, and, and how all of kind of our beliefs and background kind of thoughts and beliefs about things are so influenced by years and years of Will and Grace, Sex and the City, all these TV shows, all these movies, all this. And so what I say to people when, to Christians is if you watch Netflix for an hour, you've been lied to implicitly or explicitly for an hour. So yeah. now you need the truth, <laughs> which is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, because yeah. we're in a spiritual battle. This is spiritual warfare. You need, you've just been lied to and you've, you've watched secular humanist content that has been created from people in the dark. So all the content on, on TV is created from people in the dark. Absolutely, man. So Absolutely. you need to, to so if you're, if you're going to expose yourself to that, you need to get into the word of God and, be, and renew your mind and remember the truth and, and read the New Testament, read the, the epistles of the New Testament and be, like, and be reminded of like, I just, you know, it's funny, I'll, I was doing the dishes the other day and just listening to the first Corinthians and I was like, you know, it got to first Corinthians six where Paul says, do not be deceived you know, the, uh, uh, men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I was just listening to that, and I've read First Corinthians many, many times, but it's just like, I'm surprised that this book is still even legal in California. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised yeah. it hasn't been banned. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing, I think, uh, Christians, as we, we need to constantly be in the word of God and constantly reminded of the truth because we're we're being lied to 24 7 by the culture and we will be for the rest of our lives yeah. and jesus said this kingdom my kingdom is not of this world right so we cannot imbibe what this world is offering because th that's not his kingdom this, this world the kingdom of this world is, is satan this is well, they're Satan's teaching kingdom. it in the school system now in the public schools even little kids now should parents continue to send their kids to those schools or should they homeschool the kids? Um, I mean, with the current indoctrination that's going on in schools, yeah. I, if I had kids, I would certainly would not send them to public right. schools. Me I would either homeschool them or find some amazing, you know, classical education school that teaches yeah. kind of classical, value, you know, tradition. Absolutely, man. And if I can afford to homeschool them, I would just have to tie them down <laughs> And leave them hooked up to the bed until I come home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because you're going to lose their soul anyway if you keep putting them into that darkness like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, fortunately, even the, the schools I went to were, uh, there was no, uh, there was none of this tomfoolery going on in my schools. Yeah. We, I went, you know, to an all boys school. We obeyed. Like we were terrified of the vice principal and the principal, and we, you know, this is my uniform. This is literally my high school uniform. <laughs> and and if your top button wasn't buttoned, you got penance hall, yeah. and you got in trouble. And so we never, no one in my high school, we never even thought of rebelling against the teachers. That's or, right, man. Ever. Absolutely, it didn't even cross your mind. They would just, you know, the, here. never. Yeah. We just were like obedient and we knew that they were, they had the authority and we submitted to their authority and that's yeah. the way it was. Yeah, absolutely. Now it's complete chaos. A mess. <laughs> I want to ask this, uh, back to your father and mother, when your mother turned you into her husband, did you ever tell your father, hey dad, you know what, mama made me her husband. You need to do something about this. Did you ever tell your father? No, no, I never told him. Why? Because we didn't have that kind of relationship. We never really talked about uh, really kind of personal stuff. It was always very oh. like, hey, dad, how are you? Good, how are you? That was kind of the one thing I did tell my dad before he died. Um, we had lunch or dinner, and I, I, he, he had found out about the molestation when I was nine years old. Right. Because my brother knew. So my brother told my whole family, uh, 
But I talked to my dad about that, and I said, Dad, you know, I want to just tell you exactly what happened because you may not know the full story. And I told him everything that happened that night. And I said, the reason I didn't tell you the day after it happened is because I was, I, I was terrified that you would take matters into your own hands and I didn't want, to, I didn't want you ending up in prison. Because mm. I said, I, and I asked him, I said, what would you have done to this man? And he said, well, I would have given him two choices. Either uh, admit what he did or, and then he didn't tell me, basically, <laughs> or die. <laughs> yeah. So, and I was like, that, that's exactly why I didn't tell you. Right. Because I didn't want to break up our family over this. When you were growing up, even though your father was there, did you have that little boy, that little yearning, yearning for your father? You know, like something was missing and you knew it was a yearning for the father? Or did you know at the time it was that void, that emptiness was a yearning for the father? I didn't really notice the yearning for him I, because I, again, I was so close with my mother that I didn't really care that <laughs> I didn't have a close relationship with my father. Really? Yeah. Did you think he loved you? Yes. And did you love him? Yes. You did? Yeah. Amazing. So I got to ask this because of time. Uh, what do you think of critical race theory? <laughs> CRT? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's, um, it's demonic. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I just think it's, it's just, again, it's lies. For, it's a secular humanist worldview lie. It's just a lie from the world. Are you surprised that the schools are teaching it and the teachers would do it to the kids, teach them that, and the parents are allowing it to happen? I'm surprised that parents are allowing it to happen. Yeah. I'm surprised there's not more of an, an uproar about it. And why, do, why are you surprised by that? Because I don't know. I just think if I, I think of myself, if I had kids, I would not want them to be exposed to that yeah. in school. And exactly what is, for those who don't know, what is critical race theory? Oh, that's a, you're putting me on the spot now. <laughs> um, it's basically just pitting every race against each other. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and everything is categorized in race. And, and you know, it's kind of this division of, of this, this pecking order of racial, vic it's racial victimhood, basically. And, uh, and it's destructive because it's, it's de instead of, you know, the intention, I think, behind CRT is to unite people, but it's doing obviously the yeah, opposite. It's yeah. dividing everyone. Yeah. So it's just, it's just demonic. It's totally evil. I noticed that the most hated group of people on earth today are white people, and especially white, straight, Christian males. Yes. And they are under attack, not only in this country, but in Europe. Any white country, right? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Have you, have you noticed that? That white yeah. men are hated? Why do you think that is? Because we're, you know, white men are seen as the patriarchy who yeah. have oppressed, and white Christians who have oppressed women and who have oppressed other people. And so there's, and that's, you know, that's been going on in, on college campuses for decades, the critical, kind of this critical race theory. Yeah. And that, and all of the, many of those professors in those in, in, in universities are kind of holdovers from the '60s, kind of these hippie holdovers who are now <laughs> professors who are now, you know, teaching these kids these these beliefs and these ideas. Yeah. And these ideas have consequences. They have major consequences. And so, it's it's very dangerous to. To, to continue to push the CRT thing. And I mean, you see it all around us. Like it's, it's Absolutely. a mess. So why do white parents continue to put their children in those situations, knowing that the teachers and the, the people of color are telling them that they are evil, that everything is to blame on them, it's because of their color, just because you're born white, you're evil. Why do parents sacrifice their children to them? Because they don't have to send them to these schools. Maybe it's the white guilt. 
white guilt. Maybe white guilt. Ain't that much, it's not, ain't that much guilt in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why parents do that. I don't know why they would send their kids to schools like that. Are they afraid of being, are you afraid of being called racist? Um, no, no, because I'm not, I'm not racist. And so you wouldn't get nervous if some black person or some liberal white said you're a racist? No, I don't, no. It doesn't bother you? No, I, nothing bothers me because my, the only opinion that matters to me is God's opinion. Yeah. I don't care about man's opinion. Right on. I just care about his opinion. So, I, I, I mean, that's why I'm so vocal about the issue of homosexuality. If I cared about people, <laughs> what people thought of me, I it wouldn't would be talking be, yeah. about, yeah. I lost my career over this issue. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, once you overcame the homosexual lifestyle, you became a, are you a conservative now? Would you be considered a conservative yeah. Republican kind of person? Mm -hmm. How did Hollywood react to you? How are they treating you now? What happened as a result of that? Well, for a while, I, I was very vocal about um, my conversion to Christianity. When I would work on the set, I would tell everyone, I would tell everyone the gospel. Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> Oprah, like everyone I worked with, I would tell the gospel to. And, um, and for a long time, people were kind of intrigued and kind of cool with it, but it, it was in two years when my book came out in 2019, that's when it became untenable for me to continue to work <laughs> in Hollywood. And my agent dropped me. And, um, he dropped you mm -hmm. because of the book? Yeah. Really? Well, the, so they, they never said that explicitly. They're but, like, oh, no, he's not playing. This is real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, now, okay, it was okay for you to talk about this, <laughs> right. but now that it's in print in a book out in the world, like, we can't have you work on the set with really? these actresses and actors and all these people. And what reason they gave Did they tell you it's because of the book? No, uh, the reason they, it was a very strange reason. I got an email saying that um, <laughs> that the agency was shifting, you know, that, that uh, an agent left and my agent was taking on more clients and <laughs> that he, you know, that I was focused on my book, which is, was crazy because I was in seminary for four years, <laughs> still working. Yeah. I was focused on seminary, but I was still, I still had the same agent. Right. But when my book came out, it was like, oh, we know you're focused on your book, and so I think it's best if we part professional ways. That really? was the email. And it was, it was, that was it. And so why, I mean, you were already talking about it to everybody. People knew it. Why did the book make a difference? I think just because it, it made it way more, it made it way more visible that, you know, who I was and oh, I what, what I believed. Like it, it just, instead of it being a kind of a local thing on the set, it became like, okay, this is, Beckett's all about this, you know, he's about his Christianity and his, his and about, uh, he believes that homosexual behavior is a sin, which is scandalous to say in this town. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you can't say that in That's Hollywood. Right. Amazing. And so people like Oprah who claim to be Christians, or at least spiritual, or whatever they call themselves, would she accept you and your book, or would you be rejected by her? No, I would be completely rejected. By Oprah? Oh, yeah. And, and why? Is I mean, why? Because she's not a Christian. Yeah. And why do you say she's not a Christian? Because it's obvious. I mean, <laughs> it's just all you have to do is hear her speak for two minutes, and you know she's not a Christian. Yeah. And the people she, you know, looks up to and admires and the people she interviews, Eckhart Tolle and all these new age people, like, she's, she's lost. Yeah, I agree. So this woman, Huffington, Huff, the Huffington Post woman? Yes. That's her name, right? Yeah, Ariana Huffington. Yeah, she doesn't invite you over anymore? No, no more invitations. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got, yeah, like, I don't get invited to... I used to go to a lot of parties and a lot of dinners and things in Hollywood and Oscars and the Golden Globes and the Emmys and all the after parties, and, but I don't get invited to those things anymore. And what is that like for you? Oh, I don't care. You don't I, care? Now I look at, the, I look at like the other night the Emmys were on. I think they were on Monday. I don't know what night, but I, I don't watch any of that stuff. But when I see the Oscars and the Emmys and people, and I see that people are so excited to watch those shows... I'm just like, 
I, I, I'm so repulsed by those shows. Yeah, the people can't see, that's why. And it, it's just so kind of self-serving and self-aggrandizing, and, and it's just like, let's get together and give each other awards. It's just a bizarre yeah. cult. It's a cult yeah. to, to do that. And um, so I don't miss, no, 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 I don't miss those parties at all. I used to go to Paris Fashion Week and New York Fashion Week. I don't miss any of that. Right on. I don't want to go to that. Stuff. I noticed in Hollywood, they have been so intimidated by the radical blacks, the liberal blacks. Y'all don't let us in because we are black. Y'all don't, you're racist Hollywood and blah, 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 right? And now Hollywood have lowered, I don't know if they really had high standards anyway, but they lowered their lower standards to let the blacks in, even though most of the blacks are not qualified. They don't earn their way. How do they live with pretending that the blacks? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me that. You answer that question. I can't answer that. But you know Hollywood, behind closed doors, don't, do they say, you know, I know these black folks are not really earning well, it. Well, I'll just tell you. I'll give I you a story. I just don't want to be called a racist. I'll tell you a story. I went to the opera. This was after I was a Christian. I went with my, my best friend, who was my best friend at the time before I was a Christian. We, we went to the opera with two guys, uh, and one of the guys is a major producer at HBO. Is it HBO or Netflix? I can't remember. But um, during the intermission, we were talking, and this is this was like a, I don't know five years ago. But he said um, he said that they had a mandate at HBO or Netflix. They had a mandate now to they have to have certain amount of trans directors for their shows, a certain amount of you know, every kind of director. Yeah. And they, they, he even said, you know, we're having trouble finding trans directors because they, they don't know how to <laughs> direct this kind of show. Right. And it's like, that's, that's how, yeah. like, loopy this yeah. town is. It's just, like, insane. Yeah. I noticed that when they give out the awards, everybody, it's okay, Liz won the Best Actor or Actress Award. Everybody go, yeah, war. And I think I bet in their mind they're thinking, this bitch didn't win nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. This bitch got it because they're black or trans or something. They in the mind they know. It's like Bruce Jenner walking on the stage and they're calling, here come Miss Bruce Jenner. Yeah, Caitlyn Jenner. But we you know it's really a man in a dress. Yeah. It's like all pretense. Again, it goes back to Romans one. You have to you have to be able to suppress the truth yeah. and worship the cre creature rather than the creator to be able to, to, to believe that, to believe those lies. You, you have, have to, to be able to suppress the truth. Or be on pot. Be on pot. You ever smoked pot? No. Well, I think I tried it. I oh, never... you, you have some pot. What? You smoked pot. I did? Yeah. What? <laughs> I I literally tried it when I was uh, young and I hated it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I never liked it. Why did you hate it? Cause I just never I never tried drugs. I've never yeah. done cocaine or ecstasy, any right of those on. drugs. Right. I I never liked drugs because I'm already like <laughs> I I don't need drugs. Right on. So um, have any of your friends or anyone you know in that community or that was in that lifestyle have they? Come overcome, yeah, have they overcome that and you yeah. turned away from it? There are a, a few of my friends, a few, uh, let's see, I think two or three of my, my old friends have come to Christ. Right on. And a, a good friend in New York, uh, he used to live here, and we were great friends back in the 90s. And he is now a Christian, amazing, he's just on fire for the Lord. And he no longer lives a homosexual life. Like, he's completely rejected it. Um, so yeah, I do have a few friends. And more and more, it's funny because I, when I got saved, my assistant, who was gay, he made fun of me a lot. Uh, he, he would joke with me and be like, oh, how's baby Jesus? Like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but years <laughs> later, he's now a believer. Uh -huh. And um, and I asked him, and I said, I said, you know, what when you were mocking me when I first told you I was a Christian, what were you really thinking? And he said, actually, I was, 
I was actually interested and curious yeah. about this. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Right no. So I, a lot of my old friends, there's a lot of seeds that have been planted and they're starting to kind of like come around. Right on. What's your impression? Because time is going by now, man. But it I is? Assume, yeah. No, we got, we got it all night. <laughs> what is your impression of this group, far less liberal, radical, masochist group, the Black Lives Matter? A bunch of fat, black, radical <laughs> lesbians. <laughs> lesbians. <laughs> What's your impression of them? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, again, it's, uh, once again, it's, it's a secular humanist destructive philosophy that's Marxist. It, it has obviously it has Marxist roots. Yeah. And instead of class warfare, it's uh, it's race warfare. Instead of instead of the class struggle, the classic Marxist uh, class class struggle, it's race race struggle. And so again, it's just like CRT. It just uh, is evil, and it's. It divides people. Yeah. It's so divisive and so dis obviously destructive. Absolutely. Are you surprised that so many people bow down to them? The Christians, there were Christians washing their feet and, and worshiping them. And I was stunned by that. Are you surprised that so many, what seem to be normal people, are following the Black Lives Matter? Uh, yeah, that's very surprising. I mean, did you, it's like, did you remember when Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer kneeled on the floor with the, <laughs> yeah. what is that, the, the African yeah. kind of thing on? Um, that, that was just like beyond, that was a parody of something. I don't yeah. know, it was like a Saturday Night Live sketch. It was sketch. a mess. But yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's um, when Christians bow down to that, Again, it's once again, it's Christians not being rooted in the Word of God and Absolutely. not being grounded on the, on the solid rock of Christ. And instead of being, they're being tossed to and fro by the culture and they yeah. start believing the lies of the culture and they go with it. And it's just, it's so, it's so depressing to see that because it's like, you know the truth. Yeah. Or you're Absolutely. supposed to know the truth. And I uh, grew up on, in Alabama on a plantation. I don't know how much you know about that. And I grew up under so-called Jim, Jim Crow law. Yeah. And, but at the time of growing up, blacks and whites knew it was a spiritual battle. And I never heard my grandparents or my grandparents or my parents blame white people for anything. And they knew there were decent white people, bad white people, decent blacks, and all that, right? And at the time, I thought that white people were brave. And I would like the fact when I would see them celebrating the 4th of July and just loving America, mm. I never thought that I would see white people so afraid, and especially white men, that they're allowing these people to tear down statues and flags and, and things that they built. Because if yeah. it wasn't for white people, it would be no America. It was white men who founded the greatest country on this side of heaven. And with the help of God, they created a great country, right? But they are giving it up so easy to the children of the lie, the children of Satan. Are you surprised by that? Very surprised. I'm surprised that there's so much hate, hatred and vitriol, uh, hatred for this country. Yeah. I, yeah I'm surprised man, man. by it. Um, I mean, I just, even back in the Clinton days, I mean, people still loved America, right. you know? Remember that? Yeah, I mean, I, I look back on the Clinton days and I think that those are still, those are great times. Yeah. And whatever was going on in the Oval Office with Monica Lewinsky, at least people loved the country, yeah. right? And at least Bill and, Clinton had sense enough to invite her in the, in the office and put her under the desk. <laughs> 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 exactly. So... I, I just find it, it's just, um, it's, it's this sense of entitlement that the, the younger generation, like millennials and all these younger generations, yeah. the sense of entitlement that makes them, and the, the Marxist indoctrination that they're getting from university, that makes them hate this country. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just... It's awful. It's awful. So I got to put you on the hot seat. Oh, okay. And I need you to answer these questions as quickly as okay. possible. But first, do you love the Great White Hope? The, you mean, wait, what's the Great White Hope? You, you never heard of the I Great White Hope? I know what White it is, Hope? but I can't remember. Just tell Donald me. Donald Trump. Oh, Donald Trump. <laughs> the Great White Hope. <laughs> um, yeah, I think he's, I think he's a, I think he is a, 
bad, I can't say the word, bad arse. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. I call him the great white hope. He's the great white hope, yeah. yeah. And did you know that I started White History Month, July is White <laughs> History Month. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> we just celebrated four, our fourth year this past July. Nice. Isn't that nice? What, White History Month. Yeah. Yeah. July. And you know why I started in July? Because Gay Pride is June. Because July just feels white. It feels white. Yeah. Vacation, summer, relaxation, 4th of July. There was this whole white boy summer thing going on. Did you hear about that? No. Oh, there was like this movement of, of people doing, it was called white boy summer. Nice. And August is Men's History Month. We recognize men because they're trying to destroy men. Yeah. You love white people? I love all people. How about white people? Yes. Do you love white people? I love white people. I love black people. I love every color people. <laughs> and the, the, it's like the, every tongue, <laughs> tribe, and nation will be in heaven. So if you don't like a certain race, you're not going to like heaven. So I've got to put you on a hot Go. seat. The hot seat. Are you ever going to die? Temporarily, for like a split second, and then I'll be with Christ. Will you live so you won't live forever? No, I will. Uh, what is love? Love is Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says love is patient, love is kind, love is love bears all things. That his, Paul's definition of love is the best definition there ever is. There's it, no such thing as love is love. Is Christ returning? Yes. And so when? How soon? Nobody knows. Uh, I hope tonight. <laughs> Would you celebrate Street Pride Month with us? Every year we have Straight Pride Month. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Would you celebrate uh, White History Month with us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> White History Month. True or false, Black Lives Matter uh, was founded by a bunch of fat, black, radical, Marxist lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say that's true, I guess. <laughs> what is a man? Uh, a man is... Uh, a leader and a man God created man to be a leader a spiritual leader in his family and uh, he's losing that is Bruce Jenner a man yes uh, do you trust Anthony Fauci no well you already answered this early but have you ever done LSD no amazing did you have fun yeah, today? Uh -huh. right yes, now. I had a blast. <laughs> Thank you for coming, man. Thank you for having me. I totally me. appreciate it. Thanks for taking the hot seat. Tell the people how to listen to your podcast, read your books, and all other, what else, Elvin, you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, so my, my show is on YouTube. It's called The Beckett Cook Show, original name. And I talk about culture and the lies of culture and the truth of the Bible. And then my book you can get on Amazon or anywhere. Uh, it's called A Change of Affection and... Um, and I, my website is beckettcook.com. Right on. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Why did your mother name you Becky? I mean, <laughs> Beckett. <laughs> well, like she Northern named me Navy after Thomas, uh, Thomas a Beckett. Thomas a Beckett was uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury when Henry II was King of England in like the in, uh, 12, uh, 10 something, 1083 or 12 something. I can't remember. And he was, um, he was martyred in the Catholic Church. Oh. He was killed by Henry II. And we are all supposed to know this how? By me telling you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. I know we went over a little bit, but you see how it is, right? We can go on and on. Uh, don't forget to like, follow, ring the bell, uh, check out the Patreon, and let me hear from you. I do appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, man. Thank you. Oh, amazing. <laughs>
Thanks for watching The Father's State. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. Support my nonprofit at rebuildingdemand.com and tell everybody and their mama about the show. <laughs>